today on Impossible Engineering. The Shanghai Maglev, the fastest passenger train on the planet, with a top operating speed of 268 miles per hour. The Maglev is faster than the Formula One car. It is flying along. A train that defies the most basic laws of motion. The thing that's different and very unique about the Maglev is the fact that it floats. It took centuries of innovation and experimentation. Wow, it looks like something out of the future. <laughs> to make the impossible possible. China is a country on the rise. Its largest and wealthiest city, Shanghai, attracts people from all over the world with its ambition. As Shanghai's population increases, so does its demand for space. The city faces heavy traffic jams and congestion on a daily basis. Shanghai is busy. Cars as well as buildings fight for space on the ground. It can be very difficult to move around. By the beginning of the 21st century, Shanghai streets were at maximum capacity. A heavily congested eight-lane highway was the city's only link to the Pudong International Airport. To get to the airport by car, it takes 45 minutes. You really need something to cut through the city to get to the airport without stopping and without encountering any other vehicles. I, like most people in this city, don't have time to sit in traffic. China's solution, the Shanghai Maglev, or TransRapid. A cutting edge high speed train, the fastest in the world. The thing that's different and very unique about the Maglev is the fact that it floats. It hasn't got any wheels, it floats across the guideway all the way to the airport. Now the maglev is just about to pull out of the station. When it's at its top speed, it'd be moving at 431 kilometers an hour. That is just beyond belief, incredible. To design a passenger train capable of reaching 268 miles per hour, the Maglev's engineering team had to toss out many of the design features we've come to associate with trains. First, their train wouldn't have an engine. Huh? Then they would do away with one of engineering's most fundamental inventions, the wheel. Finally, they would defy the most basic laws of motion. But before engineers could design their futuristic train with no engine or wheels, they had to figure out a way to fit it into the already overcrowded streets of Shanghai. Shanghai is one of the most heavily populated cities in the world, and the population is increasing. Now, building the infrastructure it needs is very challenging, just because there is no space. Like all the buildings around here, the only place really to build is to go up. Chicago is one of the world's busiest cities. The logistical challenge of moving around its inhabitants is a daunting task. 
But the city's early planners came up with an idea over 100 years ago that still keeps the city moving today. In the late 19th century, Chicago is one of the fastest growing cities, if not the fastest growing city in the world. In the 1840s, shortly after the city was established, we had roughly about 4,000 people. And by 1900, we've got over a million and a half. Our city is rapidly expanding. It's almost the Shanghai of the late 19th century. So how did engineers and planners deal with the need to transport the city's growing population without clogging the busy city streets even further? began on Chicago's train in 1892. But building tracks 30 feet above the city streets was not welcomed by everybody. 3rd floor apartment tenants now had to keep their curtains closed if they wanted privacy. And young women were warned to be careful of roving rail-borne peeping toms. Nevertheless, the system was a big hit for most. It was lovingly nicknamed the L, short for elevated. We're here at Quincy. This L station has been restored, and it gives us a sense of what commuters would have seen in the late 1890s. And the basic concept of moving people in and out of the city at a different level than street level has not changed since then. Elevating the city's train was a solution so successful that more than 120 years later, the L is still transporting a half million passengers each day. The growth of the L and the growth of Chicago are synonymous. The boom of population in the late 18th century follows right along with the growth of this transit system. And I don't think without the L we would have had this great, vibrant American city that we have today. Engineers of the Shanghai Maglev are taking Chicago's idea of an elevated passenger train. Ooh. <laughs> that was fast. And giving it a 21st century twist. Engineers of the Shanghai Maglev have taken Chicago's century-old solution of an elevated railroad and created their own 19-mile guideway high above the city streets. The advantage a system like this has in already built-up urban spaces is it's very easy to install. It doesn't interfere with underground services. It doesn't interfere with existing infrastructure at ground level, which is really good. But building an elevated guideway in this part of the world came with some unique challenges. Shanghai sits in an area of great seismic activity. It also has weak clay soil. The risk of liquefaction is very high. Liquefaction is an unusual and dramatic phenomenon that can occur during an earthquake, when solid ground turns to mush. Physicist Andrew Steele has prepared a simple demonstration to show how liquefaction works. So this water represents the groundwater. This ground has got a very high water table, so it's only got a thin layer of dry soil on top of the saturated soil underneath. So imagine you build on this land. You construct your beautiful city. But you built on sandy soil and you built on a fault line. So there's the danger of an earthquake. 
you can see that as you shake it, then the groundwater is forced up into the top layer of the soil, and that changes its state from that of a solid to very much behaving like a liquid. And the buildings are just sinking straight into it. Earthquakes are a constant threat in Shanghai. If the ground liquefies, the maglevs designers had to ensure the tracks wouldn't sink into the soft soil. So engineers developed a technique called piling. They built each support pier on top of a giant concrete cap. Underneath the caps are concrete piles, which are driven 200 feet into the ground. If the soil near the surface liquefies, the deep roots will hold the maglevs track in place. In less than nine months, Chinese engineers constructed over two and a half thousand concrete columns to support the guideway. This would be the fastest train in the world. But trying to get a train up to speeds pushing 500 kilometers an hour, designers would be faced with the problem of wind resistance or drag. The greater the speed, the greater the resistance, and all this air movement has the potential effect of slowing the train down and wasting valuable energy. To build a train that can break 300 miles per hour, engineers had to look back to the great innovations of the past for the solution. The earliest evidence of railroads can be traced back to ancient Greece. Men and animals pulled wheeled vehicles in limestone grooves. The grooves prevented the wagons from leaving their intended route. Railroads were developed as a way of reducing friction. In 1805, the English discovered that a good horse on an ordinary road could pull a wagon weighing a ton. But on rails, that same horse could pull 12 wagons, each weighing three tons for six miles in just two hours. When steam power was introduced, continents could be crossed with ease, transforming the modern world. Railroads dramatically changed the way we live. But throughout the 19th and early 20th century, train design was at a standstill. Train design fundamentally hadn't changed for 100 years since this, Stevenson's rocket. You can see the classic cylindrical boiler. We've got the smokestack at the front and this completely snub, flat, unaerodynamic nose. It would take a radical thinker to shake things up. And in the 1930s, England steam locomotive engineer Nigel Gresley designed a new sleek machine that would at the time be the fastest train in the world. The Mallard. Everything about this locomotive is designed to go as fast as possible. You've got these massive wheels driving it forward. We've got a double chimney to suck out the exhaust as quickly as possible at high speed. And then you've got this beautiful streamlined shape in stark contrast to the trains that had come before. Gressley used a wind tunnel to develop the Mallard. Wind tunnels had been used on planes, but never on a train before. He made some interesting discoveries. Andrew Steele is visiting a test center called the Train Rig to see firsthand the difference a streamlined train design can create. This is the test track. It's 150 meters long, and we can accelerate trains to 75 meters a second, which is over 250 kilometers an hour. Today, we've got two different trains that we're going to be testing. This is a flat-nosed freight train, which represents sort of an unaerodynamic train as they were originally designed. And this one here is a high-speed train, got a sloped nose. We're going to see what difference that makes to the speed the train can travel at. And this is what we're going to be using for the actual experiment. These things here are light gates. And when the train goes past this one, it interrupts the light beam, and we can detect that time. Then a fraction of a second later, it'll go past this light gate, interrupts this beam. And by measuring the difference between those two times, you know this distance here so we can work out exactly how fast it's going. The model trains are fired using giant rubber catapults. 
So we're just applying some tension to the track now, and that's pulling the train back into the firing position. I'm almost as tense as the train is. OK, so just, he goes. That was fast. Ooh. And believe it or not, that was a sort of slow test run. <laughs> so now we've done that test run, the key thing is to find out the readings that we got from these light meters. We've got two readings here. At the first set of light gates, it was doing about 36 meters per second. But then by the time the second set of light gates, just a couple of meters later, it's only doing 34 and a half meters a second. So you can see it's lost some speed. The aerodynamic drag has kicked in and slowed the train down. In the short distance between gates, the flat-nosed train loses around 5% of its speed. Next to be tested is the sloping-nosed model. Ready, aim, and fire. Wow. The sloping-nosed model speed reduces by only 2% between the light gates. So these numbers, they're quite subtly different, but when you scale it up to a full-size train and you're looking to propel it constantly down the track, this can translate into a big change of efficiency. A fact Nigel Gresley discovered while designing the Mallard and exploited brilliantly. Gresley's engineering really was a complete step change. Although we'd used aerodynamics in planes and hydrodynamics was known about in boats, this was the first time those principles had been applied to a train. And that's what enabled a Mallard to travel at 126 miles per hour. In 1938, the Mallard set the record for the fastest steam train on rails, a record which still stands today. Designers of the Shanghai Maglev have learned from the breakthroughs made by the Mallard and created a train that travels at speeds that innovator Nigel Gressley would have thought to be impossible. In one test run, it exceeded 300 miles per hour. Almost three times what the Mallard was capable of. You can see it has a very sleek, streamlined design with the very smooth, sloping nose. Also, the train wraps itself around the guideway, which reduces turbulence that might otherwise be generated between the train and the track. But to build the fastest passenger train on the planet, engineers would need more than just an aerodynamic design. So they drew inspiration from a decades-old engineering experiment. They combined the principle of the hovercraft and a jet engine, and they smashed the rail speed record. To create their own impossible engineering. The Shanghai Maglev is the fastest passenger train on the planet. It travels at an astonishing top operating speed of 268 miles per hour. The train has transformed travel between downtown Shanghai and Pudong Airport. The Maglev runs all the way from here to Pudong Airport, which is a 34 kilometer journey in that direction. Now, if I was to get the metro, it would take me over an hour. If I got a cab, it would take me 40 minutes or so. But if I got the Maglev, which I like to do, it takes me only seven minutes. But the development of the futuristic Maglev took decades of experimentation before it reached its incredible 21st century performance levels. 
Created in Germany, the first passenger carrying prototype, the Transrapid Maglev system, was unveiled in 1971. It traveled at speeds where little consideration to aerodynamics was necessary. But as experiments continued and speeds rapidly increased, the train car design that now graces Shanghai's elevated track took shape. However, increased speed means increased engineering challenges. The maglev going to the airport and the maglev coming from the airport pass each other at incredible speeds, potentially a combined speed of over 860 kilometers per hour. And this could cause a potential problem. However sleek the design, any object passing another at speed creates a change in pressure between them. Lower pressure as the trains are together, followed by a return to a higher pressure once they've passed. This could potentially cause stresses to the cabin walls. So maglevs have been engineered with an aluminum composite shell light but at the same time strong and stiff enough to support the pressure acting on the structure by high speed traveling. But there were other design elements that the maglevs engineers had to consider if they wanted their train to achieve record-breaking speeds. It's not just the wind that provides friction on the train. One of the biggest losses of energy that occurs in a traditional train is produced by the friction between the wheels and the track. The more friction there is, the more power is lost. In a car like this, for example, one third of the fuel is spent on overcoming friction. To limit the negative effects of friction, engineers designed the maglev in a way that only some of history's most daring engineers have attempted. Physicist Andrew Steele is in the French countryside, looking for the remains of a system that could have been just as revolutionary as the maglev. So here it is, over 50 years old and covered in moss. This is what its creators thought would be the future of high-speed mass transit. A single concrete rail straddled by a train capable of traveling at 422 kilometers an hour, at a time when the speed record for a conventional train was just half that. So what kind of vehicle was capable of overcoming the forces of friction to travel over 250 miles per hour? The answer lies in a closely guarded warehouse. I've come to a top secret location somewhere outside Paris to get a rare look at what could have been the future of land transportation. Hello. Good morning. So, where's it kept? Hidden among an assortment of military vehicles are the last surviving examples of an extraordinary experiment. <laughs> wow. So this is the aerotrain? Yes. It looks like something out of the future. <laughs> Designed by engineer Jean Bertin in the 1960s, the Aerotrain 1 and 2 are the only surviving prototypes of a system that hoped to change train travel forever. You can see the Aerotrain doesn't have any wheels. Now, that might seem strange, but although wheels have been the basis for land transport for thousands of years, they come with a big disadvantage because the wheels rub against the ground, they create friction, and the Aerotrain tries to get round that. 
Engineers and scientists have been toying with the idea of frictionless travel for some time. The idea is that if you can remove that frictional resistance to motion, then you can make things travel faster and more efficiently. The simplest way to do that might be to levitate it on a cushion of air, and that's the principle behind how a hovercraft works. We've got our own very simple model of a hovercraft here. It's just a CD with the top of a drinks bottle on it and then a balloon. Before we inject that cushion of air, the CD only moves a very small distance across the table when I tap it. However, what we can do is attach a balloon to this drinks bottle top and see if that makes any difference to the way that the CD moves. So, there we go. You can see that now, with a tiny tap, the CD moves a long way. And just as long as the balloon's got some pressure to force that air down underneath the CD, then it'll keep on moving around freely. But when the balloon runs out, of course, the cushion of air vanishes and the CD is just as hard to move across the table as it was before. In here, we've got the guts of the air train. And incredibly, there are just two regular car engines which power massive fans, and that blasts air downwards to lift the train up off the ground, and then inwards to keep it centered on the track. That means that the train isn't in contact with the ground or the track, and so that source of friction is removed, and that means that more of the energy from this engine up here, the propeller, can be used to power the train to move forwards. It's 11 metres long, weighs 2.6 tonnes, and yet the air gushing out of these nozzles was enough to keep it floating two or three millimetres above the track. By 1967, the aerotrain was proving its potential on the test track as the next generation of passenger transport. It planned to build a track for the aerotrain between Paris and Orly, 65 miles in 35 minutes. For Aerotrain Mark II, John Vertan went all out for speed. The Aerotrain II was a futuristic combo of fighter jet, race car, train, and hovercraft. It looks like something out of a sci-fi movie, but the technology itself is actually pretty simple. I think my favorite control is this one that goes marche and arrête, so it's basically stop and go just by flicking a switch. Nevertheless, it was the combination of engineering ideas that made Jean Bertin's aerotrain groundbreaking. Bertin's ideas really were revolutionary. They combined the principle of the hovercraft and a jet engine. And this was the first time it had ever been done. Combined, they smashed the rail speed record. An aircraft jet engine gives initial thrust up to speeds of around 185 miles per hour. An additional rocket motor boosts the MPH to 235. Sadly, Jean Bertin's dream of friction-free travel died in the 1970s when the French government abandoned the experiment. But almost a half century later, the Aerotrain has a familiar looking cousin over 3,000 miles away in China. the Shanghai Maglev, the world's fastest passenger train. A unique engineering feat situated in one of China's most ambitious cities. This Maglev here is the only high-speed Maglev in the world. And that kind of chimes in with the ambition of Shanghai. People come here to be able to design daring buildings and daring systems. And one of the most daring of them all is the Maglev traveling at a staggering 268 miles per hour, appearing to defy physics. I could not believe what I was seeing and experiencing. And it's currently doing a top speed, flying pretty much at 431 kilometers an hour. And it still feels very comfortable for the speed at which it's traveling. 
The maglev is faster than the Formula One car. It is flying along. The maglev's record-breaking speed is possible because it's levitated above the track by powerful electromagnets instead of a hovercraft design like the French aerotrain. But levitating a train with magnets would be impossible without one of science's great innovators. Born in 1791, Michael Faraday was the son of a blacksmith and received little formal education, but he would go on to revolutionize the engineering world. His original laboratory still exists at London's Royal Institution, Push. where physicist Andrew Steele is exploring how Faraday's discoveries made magnetic levitation possible. Faraday's discoveries revolutionized our understanding of the interplay between electricity and magnetism. And one of the things that this understanding allows us to make is an electromagnet. So an electromagnet is made of a coil of wire. You then need to get the ends of those pieces of wire and plug them into a power supply. And finally, to magnify the magnetic effect, you often place a core of a material like iron in the middle of the magnet. Let's connect this up. And to prove to you that that's magnetic, you can see that even with this extremely simple setup, we can actually get a piece of metal to stick to it. Another crucial fact about electromagnets, if you want to use them for levitation, is that we can change their strength, and we can do that very easily. Just by changing the electric current passing through this magnet, I can turn the current down and make the attraction much weaker, or I can turn the current up and make that attraction get stronger again. Not only can electromagnets be adjusted and turned on or off at will, but they're also significantly stronger than ordinary magnets. If you want to suspend an entire train, you're going to need a pretty powerful electromagnet. And actually, electromagnets are pretty strong. This little one is enough to suspend my entire body weight. And actually, this thing needs surprisingly little electric current. There's less electricity flowing through this device than there is through your hairdryer or your kettle at home. We've got an electrical current flowing through this electromagnet. If we connect it to the piece of metal on my back, then hopefully there should be enough strength to hold me above the floor. And there you have it. On the Shanghai Maglev, powerful electromagnets are installed into the underside of the train cars, allowing them to float. Guidance magnets keep the train centered, and support magnets pull the unit to the underside of the track, lifting the train above. The entire train floats suspended 10 millimeters below the track. Not only does this reduce wear and tear, but it also makes for extremely fast, friction-free travel. Because there's no contact between the train and the guideway, there is no friction, and this means that the train can have a lifetime of up to 50 years with minimum maintenance required. But while designing China's futuristic passenger train, developers couldn't just focus on speed. They had to ensure the maglev was environmentally friendly, too. China, like all modern economies, is worried about its carbon emission quota. As development continues, the demand for oil will also likely increase. But China has a limited domestic oil supply. With its current gas guzzling congestion problems, greener transport initiatives are drastically needed. Otherwise, the city will choke. Their environmentally friendly solution came from one of history's great engineering innovators. In the late 1940s, a British engineer's groundbreaking experiment would earn him the nickname the father of maglev. This is a sheet of aluminium. When I put it on the motor and switch on 
the magnet, something pretty dramatic occurs. Electrical genius Eric Lathwaite developed the first practical linear electric motor, creating an effect he later dubbed the Magnetic River. First of all, it will levitate or support an aluminium plate. It will guide it sideways, and it will also propel it along. The linear motor takes a traditional coiled electric motor and unrolls it. Instead of spinning a rotor, what was the coil or stator provides a bed that drives the object along its length. modern vehicle being guided, lifted, and propelled, all by means of the same set of coils. Lathwaite's experiments provided the key that unlocked the potential of the maglev. The builders of the Transrapid Maglev system constructed a series of stator blocks. They are the main component of the linear motor and act as the propulsion system for the train. Once installed, they were tested in Germany and in combination with the support and guidance magnets enabled the Shanghai Maglev to levitate. The train can travel over 300 miles an hour without an onboard engine. A linear motor is embedded into the guide wave. But don't be fooled into thinking this whole track is electrified all the time. What is so brilliant about this system is that only the sections of the track on which the vehicle moves is powered at any time. So as it sets off, the track ahead of it is dormant, and only the section in front of the maglev turns on. As soon as the maglev has passed over the short section of track, it turns off again. As the job of pushing the maglev along is taken up by the next section of track, and so on and so on, all the way to its destination. But with less than six inches between the maglev and its guideway, even the slightest malfunction could be catastrophic. It is critical to maintain an even gap between the train and the track, no matter how many passengers are on board. To do this, the maglev's builders had to create one last piece of impossible engineering. Traveling at an astonishing 268 miles per hour while floating on a magnetic field, the Shanghai Maglev is the only high-speed train of its kind operating commercially in the world. But having a levitating train fly through Shanghai at such high speeds comes with several engineering challenges. There is a carriage hurtling along at over 430 kilometers per hour. So it is critical to control fluctuations in the magnetic field and maintain an even gap between the train and the track, no matter how many passengers are on board or what variations there are in the load it's carrying. With just six inches between the maglev and its guideway, any errors could see the train crunch into the track. The engineering team's solution, as physicist Andrew Steele demonstrates, relies on sensors constantly regulating the current flowing through the electromagnets. There we go. You can see this permanent magnet is suspended underneath this electromagnet. Whenever the permanent magnet moves slightly imperceptibly closer, this little sensor on the bottom here detects that, sends a message down to these electronics, and tells the electromagnet to become a little bit weaker. It turns down the current. And that allows the ball to fall away a little bit. 
And as it falls away, the sensor detects that again and increases the strength of the electromagnet and pulls the ball back towards it. So one complication of this system is that your feedback system always needs to be working. It needs to be working very fast. You can see this ball is spinning and wobbling a tiny bit. And that's fine for a little demonstration like this. But if you've got a train traveling at hundreds of kilometers an hour along the track, you're going to need a very, very sensitive and accurate feedback system. The Shanghai Maglev takes this simple concept to a whole new level. There are 128 sensors in each section of the Maglev vehicle. They feed back the distance between magnets and track thousands of times a second. Powerful computers adjust the electromagnet's current constantly with microscopic accuracy. This is the guideway. And the train floats one centimeter from the guideway. Now that is incredible precision. Now there's a computer system that makes sure that all of the time, the train floats at one centimeter from the guideway. An advanced computer system regulates the operation of the train service. Each journey's travel time is predictable to the second. Now this is the ambition of the Maglev. With computer systems, they've been able to achieve an extremely precise service. It's taken decades of planning, design, and testing to create the world's only commercially operating high-speed Maglev. It's a unique concept that throws away the rule book for traditional train travel and makes high-speed journeys possible in engineless vehicles. A system like the Maglev points to the future of transport in our world. Incredible things to be achieved. This shows us that we can get people moving from A to B in short periods of time, which is great. By drawing on the innovations of the past, adapting, improving them, and making breakthroughs of their own, the designers and engineers of the Shanghai Maglev have realized the dream of a super-fast train that flies without wings and have succeeded in making the impossible possible. It's kind of unbelievable that there's a train that goes over 400 kilometers an hour. It is a vision of the future, and it's here right now.